Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches revives our houseplants and potted tropicals. We have a visit from last winter with Leon Sloan in Kingston, Oklahoma, to find out how to create one of his famous wicking buckets from recycled materials. Urban forester Mark Bays has a primer on tree pruning, and OSU Extension Pesticide Coordinator Kevin Shulton identifies some household hazards to help us stay safer at home. springtime we start pulling out some of our house plants as we're doing a spring cleaning of our house often we're ready to kind of push them out onto the patios to give give ourselves a little more space in our own home and you might have many different types of house plants but I wanted to talk to you about how to kind of rejuvenate them because I know after a long winter sometimes they don't have the optimal conditions and so they can get a little ragged and so often house plants don't need a lot of care and so they can go years without really much maintenance and after years without maintenance again they'll start to look ragged so we have one um, that has seen better days right here this is called uh, uh, Sansevieria or snake plant um, and you can see it's a good clump of snake plant here um, but it's it's got some dead leaves in here some sunburned leaves some bruised leaves and things like that so we're just going to give it a clean up we're going to start first actually by taking it out of its pot because the plant is so far down in there I can't really cut those leaves out so I'm going to tip this over on its side you just kind of want to press on the root ball a little bit and then gently tug on it to pull it out. Now, this particular type of house plant, uh, Sansevieria, it actually likes to be root bound. And so it's one that you can definitely just plant it and forget about it for a while. Um, some house plants don't like to be as root bound as what this one does. You can see it's still healthy though. It's got plenty of new growth coming on. It's got some good roots in there. Um, it just needs a little bit more love. Now I have to say, if you say you just have a black thumb and you cannot grow a plant at all, try this one, because this one can grow in very dark areas in your house almost. I wouldn't say dark, don't put it in a closet, but it doesn't need a lot of sun. And in fact, some plants can actually get sunburnt, and this is one of them. So if you were to bring this out from a shady location and put it out into bright sun, you're gonna see where that sun actually damages those plant cells and, and causes some more uh, severe damage to them, which means less of that plant is actually gonna be photosynthesizing. Now, what we're gonna do on this one is just start by removing some of this dead stuff um, that you can see on here. We just wanna clean it up. And even some of these that are, you can see it's got some bruising and some damage all through it. We're gonna go ahead and even trim some of those leaves back just to really give this a nice cleanup. The first thing that we're gonna look at is take out anything that's completely dead all the way through. So you can see some of this is dead and we're just gonna take it all the way back to the main shoot. Some of the other ones, such as this leaf, you can see that the majority of the leaf has been compromised. The tip is damaged. The midrib here is damaged on it. Um, even the margins are damaged. And as you go down, you can see at the base of it that the leaf has been broken down here. So there's really no more life in this plant at this point, or this particular uh, leaf at this point. So as I mentioned, Sansevieria really does like to be root bound. So I'm not necessarily going to increase the pot size on this particular plant. I'm basically planting it back in a new pot. It just needed more potting soil and some more fertilizer because you can see there's 
hardly anything but roots here at this point. Um, you could divide this if you wanted to. I'm not going to at this point because I still want a nice sized pot. Um, but you can see easily you could take a knife or a saw of some sort and like an ornamental grass, just divide it and you would have another plant right here next to it that you could take and separate. Um, at this point, because it was so low in that pot, I've already filled up my container here, my new container with some more potting soil. Before I put it in there just yet, I'm going to um, mix in some Osmocote that I have here. Osmocote or some other slow release fertilizer is a nice addition to house plants. And we're just gonna work that into the potting soil so that it's accessible to that plant as it continues to grow. So we've got our fertilizer in there. So now we'll just add our plant on top of that and put some more soil around it. So you can see we took a fair amount of damaged or dead tissue off of this plant already. And yes, there is still a little bit on our main plant, um, but at this point we don't want to remove too much. Again, there's always that rule of one third when you're talking about pruning plants. Um, and so we've got this planted up. We've top dressed it again with a little more of that slow release fertilizer. And this is ready to either be placed in a shady patio or to go back into your home. Now spring is always the best time to do this because the plant is going to go into its growing cycle and so it's going to really take up that fertilizer and continue to flourish and find its new home um, and adjust to that. So this spring, take time to repot those house plants that have been neglected for a little while. And for more information, check out this fact sheet. Today we're here at Kingston, Oklahoma, and joining us is Leon Sloan with Leon's Greenhouses. And Leon, you've got a, a new take on an old concept, really. Can you share with us this idea of this container garden? Okay, well, we were looking a way to get rid of the excess plastic we have on this earth. You know, there's milk jugs, water jugs, and tea jugs that are floating down the rivers into the Gulf that's killing our mammals in the ocean. Yeah. And we want to stop that, so what we've done, we've taken these mineral tubs, this is a 20 gallon mineral tub that the cows have licked all the mineral out of, and then we take these, and we take our empty milk jugs, and our water jugs, and our tea jugs, and orange juice jugs, and put them <laughs> in the, we put seven of them around the outside edge. Uh -huh. We've drilled holes in the bottom and in the top to, uh, make them where the whole water will come in the bottom and air go out the top. When the water recedes, then they'll suck air back in them. And so we use this away to give us a platform above the water level to keep the plants from drowning. Okay, so by having these containers, they're going to be full of water, completely full? Or how, well, do, how do we control the level of the water? Because you have an excess water level hole right here that's about five or six inches up here and we'll have that much water in it and then you'll have this much air and then you'll have your soil above that okay but there is about 15 to 20 percent of this soil that's touching the bottom of the tub around this inside jug right here you see we put soil down around this and this is what wicks the water back up to the plant so you're going to have these columns of soil between the containers that's correct okay all right, so and then the rest will be full of uh, soil, and obviously we have a good eight inches right. of root zone that those plants can grow now, in. A potting soil, not garden dirt out of the garden, okay? Now then, with because of so many bottles of floating into the ocean and killing our mammals, now we've decided we want to hide these soda pop bottles, which are everywhere. So we take these soda pop bottles and we put them and fill these cracks up all the way around the outside. Now, yes, we had to put holes in the bottom and in the top of this so that we can stick it in there and water will come back and forth in your jugs. So we put one between every one of those. Okay. And we got rid of, now we've gotten rid of about uh, two, four, six, seven more soda pop bottles that's not going to go kill our mammals in the ocean. Now then we've got about 15 to 20 percent of our soil that's going down in these cracks that will touch the water and wick it back up to the plant. 
Uh -huh. and, you, and you have found that this ratio with this uh, amount of uh, columns of soil actually works well with the ratio of air and stuff? Correct. We've tried it with like 40-60 uh, ratio and it's too much water and it'll drown the plant. So we have to go on down to about 15 to 20 percent okay. soil touching the water. And tell, and tell me about this uh, pipe that's sticking well, out. What this is just a, a one inch pipe that we cut on an angle to so when it sets on the bottom, water can still run out of it. We cut the threads off of one of these jugs and just stuck it in there so the soil wouldn't fill the bottom of it up. Mm -hmm. And when you water, you put your water in this hole. But now, before you put your water in, we recommend putting a teaspoon of fertilizer to every gallon of water you put in here. Okay. So take your five gallon bucket, put your five teaspoons of fertilizer in it, and put your funnel in here and pour it in until it runs out your excess hole here. And then you know it's full and good for another week, 10 days. That's amazing. And, and really this allows the water to get down to that root zone initially. You could water at the top of this as well. You just want to make sure it still flows out. Is that correct? That's correct. Now I will mention that if you're going to have this sitting outside and not in a high tunnel uh -huh. where we're getting all these excess rains in the spring, then you fill this full of potting soil instead of filling it level, you round it up in the middle where it'll be mounded and then you take a, a trash bag and you take and lay it over here, cut you a little X where this pipe is and push it down over it, tie your string around to hold your plastic down and then the excess rain will come off of the barrel and not in your barrel. So you kind of created a, a small raised bed plasticulture That's garden right. for You're your right. vegetables. You are correct. Okay, all right. So now while these are very functional, some might not find them quite as aesthetically pleasing to put on your front porch if you're looking to put petunias or something like that. Um, is there some way that we can take this and retrofit it to be a more aesthetically pleasing container? Well, yes, I've been notified that these are not <laughs> appealing to the ladies in the front porch. So some of them take and paint these. Even though they come in different colors. Yeah. Oh, they do, <laughs> yes. But they still want them painted either a brown or a maroon or something right. like that to look more like the uh, pots. Uh -huh. So what we've done, we tell you just go, is this what you're going to yep, see right yep. here now? Look at here. We decided to go get a fancy pot. And I know there's a hole in and there. Right there it is. It's a plastic pot, mm -hmm. so it was easy to drill a hole through? Yes, it was. Okay. Once, when I, there's no holes in the bottom. Mm -hmm. No holes in the bottom. It's strictly where it'll hold water. There was not a hole in that t uh, container when we purchased it. Just. So we drilled one hole five inches up. And then we took a uh, just a, uh, a... Here's one of the old pots that somebody, you know, was growing in and the plant died in it because it got holes in the bottom and they didn't keep it watered. So we just take that and turn it upside down in there. And you can see now you've eliminated about 75% of that soil touching the bottom. Of course, it's just. So how do you prevent, when you fill this with soil, this is replacing those milk bottles and plastic uh, containers. How do you keep the soil from going down into those okay, holes? Okay, we take a little piece of our garden, our, our uh, ground cover and just put it over those holes like that. Okay. and then fill it full of potting soil around and you've got the same thing as you've got over in that mineral tub as you have in this pretty container for the flowers and this, the ladies are a lot more happy about this. <laughs> well and of course this is woven plastic so putting just plastic wouldn't work because you want that That's air correct. movement through You want through the air there. movement through there, you are correct. Okay, yes. excellent, excellent. Okay. All right, well it sounds like a great way to allow yourself a little vacation time during the summer from your garden. Oh it does, this will, this will take care of it while you're gone. Thanks for sharing this with us. You're Leo. certainly welcome. Hi, I'm Mark Bays with Oklahoma Forestry Services, and now is a really great time to be out looking at our trees, pruning our trees, and just doing a little bit of that work that, you know, it's the end of the winter time, spring is here, so I just thought we'd take a little bit of time with you to go through some basic pruning techniques. So let's take a look now on this one bottom branch, and I'm going to demonstrate the three cut technique on it. So this is about a, a three inch diameter branch. And so I want to use the three cut technique on that because if I was just to cut this, which is where my final cut was to be, there's so much weight on it that it might strip down and open up a cavity on the main trunk of the tree. And that's what you're really trying to avoid. So in the three cut technique, 
you find a place a little bit away from it, you come up underneath it, and you cut maybe about no more than a quarter to a third of the way through the trunk on the bottom section of that. So when you get to about that point, you see here, that's a little bit, little bit more than a third. So then you make your second cut just on the outside of that. And then what the hopes is, is when that tree breaks off, is that it won't strip any bark on the lower end on that. And this is true on both dead branches or particularly live branches. And that's a nice clean cut. It didn't strip any of the bark off there. So we've got most of the weight off of that tree now. Now we have to make that last and final cut. So every time you remove a branch, you do what's called target pruning. You're looking for the branch collar. There's a branch bark ridge on a tree, which is right where the bark from the main stem to this branch comes in contact. That's the branch bark ridge. You never want to cut into that. The branch collar is the swollen area connected to that, that, that connects that branch to the, to the main trunk of the tree. And you want to make that pruning cut just on the outside of the swelling. So that, and it, there's no particular angle on this. The branch will tell you what angle. Used to be, they say, cut straight up and down. You want to flush cut. None of that is true. Each branch angle is independent. And so you have to look at that carefully on every branch that you remove and make a nice finished clean cut just like that. So you see here now where I did not cut into the branch bark ridge. It's a little bit of an angle and that should close off that wound quite nicely. So now I'd like to uh, demonstrate how to make a proper cut on a dead branch. And this just happens to be up in the tree a little bit so I'm using my pole saw. The one thing to remember, whenever you're removing dead out of a tree, you do not want to cut into the live tissue because then you will create more problems. The, the tree is starting to close that branch off a lot of times. So on this nub up here, this small branch up here that I'm getting ready to cut, you can see right there where I'm pointing that the tree is already trying to close that branch off. So I'm making the cut just on the outside of that, being very careful not to cut into that live tissue. So even though that looks like there might be just a little bit of stub like that, I was really careful about not cutting into the live tissue, and that's what you always want to do whenever you're removing dead. So once you've removed the dead, now you look for the crossing branches. And you can see here on this particular branch here, this was not properly cut. That was just cut in the middle of the branch, and so there's a little bit of dead there. So I want to remove this part of it. But if you look down here, you also see this same branch is rubbing with this other branch down here. So I need to remove this whole thing since they're rubbing together. Now I'm going to go ahead and use a lopper and this is the scissor type lopper cuts. Whenever you use these you want to make sure that the cutting end is on the inside of the branch where you're leaving. That way you get the cleanest cut on that branch that's up there. So I'll just go ahead, I'll go ahead and just lighten the load here. Not that it's necessary but I just want to open it up just a little bit for me so I can get in there. So just make a few cuts like that. Remove that so you see how that's pulled out away from that. Give me a little bit more working room in here. So I'll be making that right on that branch collar here. So I'll come up here and just make the cut like that. So you can see it's right outside that branch collar. That wound should close off really nicely. Now looking on this same branch here, you see this one coming down here and that's also rubbing on that larger branch. So I'm going to go ahead and get my saw and I'll go ahead and remove this. You can see here that on this flowering crab apple that it's starting to close that previous cutoff quite nicely. Well some species and crab apples are one of those that even if you make a proper pruning cut you'll see that it's starting to sucker here and these suckers or water sprouts whatever you want to call them it's always important to remove those. <clears throat> so just to recap now, you always want to make sure that you remove the dead first, then the crossing branches like we did, and then open up the center part of the tree, particularly those water sprouts that are taking away nutrients from the other part of the tree. And always make sure that you're very conservative in your pruning. You never want to take out too much. So I'd like to stick more along lines of that 20 to 25%.
I hope this has really been helpful. I've hoped you learned a little bit of something. If you have any other questions, please, there's a number of fact sheets you can go to. You can call Oklahoma Forestry Services, but let's get out. It's the right time of year. Let's get out and prune our trees. Hi, my name's Kevin Shelton and I'm the pesticide coordinator uh, with the uh, Entomology and Plant Pathology Department here at Oklahoma State University. And I would like to talk a little bit today about uh, pesticide storage, uh, what is, what isn't a pesticide, some disinfectants, some viricides, and how to protect yourself and your family when using these things. Uh, if you uh, look on the Poison Controls website, nowadays uh, with the advent of the coronavirus and the COVID-19, we've seen an increase in personal exposures uh, to pesticides. And this traces back to a lot of the cleaning and disinfectant products. And believe it or not, if you're talking about a disinfectant or a cleaner, if it's got an EPA registration number on it, it is in fact a pesticide. And we don't really think about you know, cleaners and such disinfectants as a pesticide, but they are a viricide or a bactericide. Uh, just, you know, same thing as a pesticide, a herbicide or an insecticide, you know, would be a pesticide. And so with the advent of this pandemic, we have a lot of people that are cleaning, and as well they should, a lot more these days. And so we're seeing an increase in personal exposures to some of these products. Well, the exposures that we're seeing an increase in has a lot to do with the aerosol disinfectants. And so everybody is disinfecting a lot more these days, uh, and we may or may not, you know, adhere to the label as much as we should. And so open the window, you know, uh, try to, to ventilate an area if you're cleaning it every day. Okay, as for storage of a lot of your cleaners and disinfectants, we all know that we need to keep them out of the reach of small children. If you have, you know, anything under the sink, you know, make sure you've got locks on these uh, cabinet doors so you can't get in. Even better, put them up out of the reach of small children. And again, put a cabinet lock or something like that. You may want to think about locking it in a cabinet in the utility room or something like that. All right, we've talked about storing of the disinfectants uh, and also want to mention, and, and this is just really, I think we know this, but it doesn't hurt to remind everybody ever so, ever so often. Uh, if you have a pesticide, herbicide, insecticide, whatever, uh, you need to keep it out of the house. It's better if you can store it in the garage, in a locked cabinet. Uh, away from small kids, just away from everybody. And so if you've got a garden shed or garage or something like that, you know, be sure and keep these locked up. Uh, I also want to mention while we're on the use of pesticides, and this also goes over with the cleaners and the disinfectants on personal protective equipment. If you read the label of a pesticide, you know, it will tell you what you need to wear to protect yourself. A lot of times uh, that's long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes and socks. That's kind of our standard uh, reply on what you need to wear. But read the label. It will also talk about uh, gloves or respirators if you need to wear those. A lot of times on this it will say just a uh, waterproof glove. So a latex dishwashing glove, something like that would be fine. Uh, some of the products actually require a nitrile glove, which is a little different material, and it's a little more chemical resistant. Uh, even on your cleaners over here, uh, read the label on these things, and it will tell you what you need to wear, and if you need to use gloves, be sure and do that. And also remember, as on these labels, as on your traditional insecticides, herbicides, uh, what you read on the label is actually the minimum that's required. We can always do better on protecting ourselves. And so if it's uh, a regular shirt, you know, wear a long sleeve shirt. Uh, if it says waterproof gloves, wear chemical proof gloves. If it doesn't have a glove statement on there and you've got gloves around, put them on anyway. And so the idea is 
to lessen the exposure to our person. And so we need to keep all these products off of us as much as we can. Wow. All right, I also want to mention and maybe kind of end with this, uh, don't mix your cleaning products. Uh, we've had cases of people mixing chlorine bleach and vinegar or ammonia for various things, and that can lead to pretty disastrous results. Uh, same thing for your, uh, your garden products. Uh, while there are tank mixes of herbicides, uh, you're usually not gonna get a benefit from mixing some of your insecticides. Uh, they're formulated from the factory to do what they need to do. So again, careful mixing with your uh, herbicides, your insecticides, and on your cleaners, uh, just don't mix these things. Uh, they've been formulated to do everything they need to do, and so just leave it at that. Uh, and I also want to end up with uh, guys, just uh, try and be safe out there. For the next three weeks, we will not be on the main OETA channel, but you can find episodes of the best of Oklahoma Gardening on the OETA World Channel. And be sure to keep an eye on our social media for special programming as well. We wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>